Ceylon, where the country's tiny 8,000-man army has just had its first ever taste of active combat. General Atigali briefs his men on flushing out the so-called Che Guevara guerrillas, thousands of discontented students whose armed rebellion against the government has brought Ceylon to its biggest crisis since independence. Fighting broke out in Ceylon on the night of April the 5th, when well-organized bands of guerrillas struck simultaneously at 25 police posts throughout the country. The government claimed the insurgents were members of a banned student organization known as the People's Liberation Front, and had declared a state of emergency two weeks earlier, when it became clear the unrest was founded on nationwide discontent. In the first few weeks of the fighting, government security forces made short work of the rebels, who proved in many cases to be ill-trained, enthusiastic students. With strict censorship in operation, no casualty figures were published. The government claimed only 100 rebels were killed, but some newspaper reports estimated the real figure at 1,500. Western journalists also accused the security forces of needless brutality, particularly with prisoners, and even alleged that mass executions had taken place. Ceylon is a small island lying some 40 miles off the coast of India. It's roughly the same size as Ireland, and its thousand miles of coastline offers the same attractions to armed smugglers. Throughout the emergency, Ceylon's tiny navy has been constantly on the alert against any attempt to smuggle arms to the guerrillas. The Indian navy also helped in carrying out searches and actually arrested two North Korean trawlers trying to get illegal arms ashore. Fishing craft, fishing craft, stop your engines. We are coming to search you. We are coming to search you. This time the suspects were small fry, but the government was taking no chances on even the smallest trickle of help reaching the rebels. Although most of the fighting looks to be over, a guerrilla campaign could be fought in the jungles for years. We put this point to Ceylon's Home Affairs Minister, Mr. Bandaranayaka. Well, I should imagine that the back of the insurgent terrorist action is already broken. But the cleanup operations could take a substantial period of time because it's a slow process to pick up the stragglers and to deal with them according to law. We were aware of an insurgent danger to this country. We had been aware of it for some time. But it is perfectly true we were not prepared in a military sense to deal with it, having regard to the ramifications of it and the degree of uh, preparedness that they had engaged in, and we were definitely caught off guard in a military sense. In the capital, Colombo, all is now quiet, but no one is taking this as a sign the rebellion's been crushed. Government troops may control the cities, but there's not enough of them to control the countryside as well. In any case, the answer to Ceylon's crisis doesn't lie with the military, but with the politicians here in Ceylon's parliament. Responsibility for putting Ceylon back on its feet lies with this woman, Mrs. Sirimavo Bandaranayaka, the Prime Minister and leader of a left-wing coalition government which includes a number of communists. Previous governments, including her own, had tried and failed to find the solutions to Ceylon's chronic economic problems. Last year, Mrs. Bandaranayaka again swept to power after promising an ambitious program of socialist reforms. But time was running out, and within nine months, the euphoria of electoral success had been replaced by disillusionment and active discontent. At the state opening of Parliament, Mrs. Bandaranayaka's election manifesto was read out as her intended government programme. She promised jobs for all, a lower cost of living, cheap housing for the poor, rapid industrialization, and expanded health services. Almost immediately afterwards, the finance minister announced the country was bankrupt. Disillusionment with yet another government may have provided the spark that set off the guerrilla rebellion, but the real causes of the revolt are far deeper. They're to be found in the marketplace. Ceylon's economic problems are immense. It's a rich agricultural country, yet it has to import its own food. 
Its major exports fetch low prices on world markets, and this in turn means Ceylon has less foreign exchange to spend on industrialization. It's a vicious circle that hasn't been helped by the revolt. Economic troubles brought on the rebellion, and now the rebellion is making the economic situation worse. The crisis has forced the government to introduce food rationing, and rice queues like this are now a common feature of life in the towns. Rice, together with dried fish, is the staple diet of Ceylon, and a quarter of all the arable land is given over to growing it. Even so, Ceylon has to import nearly half the rice it needs. This year, that means nearly 400,000 tons, most of it coming from communist China. Rice occupies a key position in the economy. The government subsidizes the price so that everybody can afford it. And whilst this ensures that nobody starves, it imposes a heavy burden on the country's finances, so much so that the government's been using its foreign aid funds to buy fish and rice instead of industrial and farming machinery. And it could be forced into importing even more food if the rebels, who are most active in the rice-growing areas, manage to disrupt distribution. In the towns, meanwhile, Prices are shooting up on the free market, a clear indication that supplies are already falling off. Ceylon is very much a plantation economy, with 70% of the population working on the land. In common with other developing countries, it depends almost totally on exports of its primary commodities for its foreign exchange. Coconuts and coconut products earn 12% of Ceylon's foreign currency. Ceylon's second biggest export is rubber. These plantations provide the country with 20% of its foreign exchange. They also provide ideal conditions for fighting a guerrilla war, and many Che Guevara groups are using the plantations as bases to fight hit-and-run actions against the security forces. In recent years, rubber prices have dropped on the world markets, and Ceylon has found the best deal it can get is from the Chinese, who take it above the world price in exchange for rice. But Ceylon's most important crop by far is tea, which accounts for two-thirds of all foreign exchange earnings. Ceylon is the world's second biggest tea producer, a fact of little comfort for the Ceylonese. With world output going up by 3% and demand increasing by only 1%, prices have been falling for several years, and Ceylon's income with them. Last year, revenue dropped by $10 million, equal to nearly 5% of the country's entire income. The fate of Ceylon's exports on the world commodity markets suggests that the country's economic ills are not all self-induced. But it does point up the need for drastic action, for a thoroughgoing diversification of the economy, to get away from dependence on one or two primary products and create new jobs for Ceylon's growing number of unemployed. International involvement in the crisis has come in another area. The government alleged the North Korean embassy in Colombo was providing the guerrillas with propaganda material during the insurrection. Mrs. Bandaranaka responded by breaking off diplomatic relations and expelling the embassy staff. Despite this incident, most observers still saw the revolt as a spontaneous popular movement. Even the government disclaimed direct foreign involvement. Mr. Bandaranaka again. I think our findings are at the moment that really there has been no direct foreign involvement of any sort. One embassy, as Mrs. Bandaranaka stated in her broadcast message to the nation, had behaved somewhat foolishly and indiscreetly in its own propaganda efforts and thereby indirectly helped the terrorist insurgents. She had occasion to warn that particular embassy and when the warning was not heeded, she had occasion to ask the embassy personnel to leave the country. Ceylon University, cordoned off with barbed wire and occupied by troops, is the key to the rebellion. The 
reasons not difficult to find. The guerrilla movement is largely organized and led by unemployed graduates, of whom Ceylon has 14,000, all products of a free and compulsory education system that's wildly out of step with the nation's economy. The rank and file of the movement is provided by school and university students, teachers and Buddhist monks. 60,000 are thought to be involved. Although the government seemed to be taken by surprise by the scale of the revolt, the first signs of the crisis showed themselves last year when the Ceylon Special Branch produced a report on a revolutionary political youth group known as the People's Liberation Front dedicated to overthrowing the government. And as recently as last September, the authorities marched 63 of these young people into court to face various charges of subversion. The declared aim of the April the 5th insurgents was to topple Mrs. Bandaranaika's government and replace it with an even more left-wing administration. They failed, but the fact that the attempt was made at all has shown the government just how urgently reforms are needed. We asked Mr. Bandaranaika if the uprising had forced the government to review its policies. I don't think so, because I think our program is a fairly radical one as it stands. But much remains to be done, and maybe the administrative process could be speeded up somewhat. And I think it will have to be speeded up if we are to make any effective impact upon the problems of our country and of our time. But it would be incorrect to say that the Che Guevarists, as they call themselves, or as they are called sometimes by others, have led to any changes in the basic thinking of the centre-left policies of Mrs. Bandarnak's government. My estimate would be, very broadly speaking, that it would be that we've got approximately 100 million rupees or more to find in the immediate future in foreign exchange to get over the immediate effects of the crisis. Ceylon's dire economic straits and constant need for aid has meant close scrutiny from the World Bank and other financial institutions. But even they are having difficulty working out Ceylon's true financial position because of wildly fluctuating exchange rates. A dollar presented in the street, for example, can fetch twice as many rupees as it would in a bank or in a shop. The result has been a marked reluctance on the part of the international bankers to lend Ceylon any more money. The government, in turn, has had to stop non-essential imports, and this, in turn, has made some consumer goods extremely valuable assets. A small second-hand car sells for nearly $10,000. On the surface, at least, Ceylon looks the sort of place that has everything going for it. A fertile land, a well-educated population, and leaders of considerable intellectual accomplishment. But with a $200 million deficit expected this year, Ceylon is again on the edge of bankruptcy. An attractive beach not far from Colombo illustrates a possible solution to some of Ceylon's problems. Tourism. Much of Ceylon's coastline is like this, wide sandy beaches dotted with poor fishing villages. The problem is that only the very rich can afford to fly out to Ceylon for their vacations, and so enormous sums would have to be invested to provide the kind of resorts they're accustomed to. This is the sort of investment that would be needed, the glittering new Pegasus Reef Hotel near Colombo, which has just opened its doors to its first guests. The travel brochures describe Ceylon as a rare gem awaiting discovery, praising its coral coastline and eulogizing on its ancient Buddhist civilization. The government is now trying to encourage the tourist trade with some eagerness, but it's still on a small scale and is only of marginal benefit to the economy. The present emergency, of course, hasn't helped to attract the tourists. Roadblocks, arms searches and a 12-hour curfew are not the best kinds of publicity. Get 
The Prime Minister's critics say she's exaggerated the crisis to divert attention from the state of the economy and her own government's mismanagement. Although the fighting may be over for the moment, Ceylon's crisis certainly isn't. The rebels are reported to have taken control of some country areas from which they hope to organize a more permanent form of resistance. If economic reforms are not pushed through quickly, Mrs. Bandaranaika could, in a few years' time, be faced with a much stronger challenge to her authority.